Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast, which delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 212, and today's topic is going to be exploring femininity and fluidity. So this topic is not gender-based, actually. We are going to be exploring the masculine and feminine side of all beings. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss how harnessing or I guess provoking or connecting with your divine femininity can help you to connect to your higher self, can help you to feel your truth and harness intuition, can help you to collaborate and connect versus compete, and so much more. Becky and I will be sharing our personal evolution in femininity. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting of a topic for me to take on, a, a big, I guess, shift or evolution in my overall wellness journey because I've always considered myself such a kind of tomboy type. Mm-hmm. And uh, this has been a process that I think in the last decade has really created a lot of growth. Yes, and kind of a more esoteric and abstract topic than we usually cover, but we'll still have some good nuggets for you guys to take away and and apply for sure. So before we dive in today, let's just have a quick word from our opening sponsor for this episode, Fond Bone Broth. Yes. So Fond is truly wellness well made. They are slow simmered bone broth that come in a glass jar, so non-toxic packaging and quality ingredients. They source from organic farms and they also use free range chicken bones. They include the feet and the back, so you still get a very gelatinous delivery of collagen, gelatin, and L-glutamine. But my favorite thing about Fond is not just that they're awesome sourcing, is not just that they are clean and really nutrient dense, but the flavor profiles are phenomenal. They have a fantastic combination, just like we source with our naturally nourished supplements to create these synergies of food as medicine. So they have combinations of flavors that not only taste amazing, but also enhance the nutrient density. So like their turmeric cracked pepper or their beets and hot peppers and so much more. Um, They have a seasonal one coming out with the chipotle Uh, butternut squash, which is phenomenal. It's like Thanksgiving in a jar. (laughs) Yes. And I think getting into fall bone broth is going to be sounding much more appealing. (laughs) Yes. But I've been honestly sipping on fun. And this is the one that I can get all people that think that bone broth tastes like hot meat juice Mm -hmm. to open their (laughs) mind and experience how bone broth can actually be a light and maybe in today's episode, more feminine approach to broth. Totally. (laughs) Less hearty, maybe more artisan, if you will. Yes. So go on over and check out fondbonebroth.com. You can use the code AllieMillerRD at checkout. It's fondbonebroth.com. And you will thank me because you will be sipping on a sous chef in a jar. Truly fantastic flavor profile. You can use it to work with recipes and also just as a delightful sip that heals your gut and your whole body. Yes. So, so good. All right. So let's kick off and talk a little bit about, I guess, one of the biggest areas of channeling this divine feminine or connecting to your intuition. Yeah. So there was a piece done by Suzanne Kingsbury, who is a writer and she does these divine feminine workshops. And, um, I was looking up on some of her work and she connects with, uh, the works of like, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe and does all these connections within the movement and tapping into your inner writer. 
And so she highlights five different areas of focus that I thought would be cool to explore in today's conversation. And intuition is definitely, I think, Becky, the the biggest one when we talk about being women and especially in the world of moms. It's like what feels right for, for what you do with your child. But she breaks down intuition, creation, community, sensuality, and collaboration as, as the kind of top five things. And I think that honoring your intuition or what you feel is one of the best ways to honor that femininity. If we think the masculine part of the mind is very analytical, it's uh, much more objective likely, um, looking for hard facts and mm-hmm. you know what's the most pragmatic approach to this? <laughs> what's gonna save the most money to, mm-hmm. to do? Um, and we can think of this as, as we banter about our husbands through this, yep. but, but we all have this within <laughs> ourselves too. And, um, you know, when we go too analytical, um, we can lose two things. There's both your gut feelings, which I think can be even more animalistic. Like we know when we're stressed, we've talked about how you get like butterflies in the gut or when you feel uneased, right? Or, you know, before you'd go on stage or a new date, there's this physical reaction in the body. So you can listen to your body actually as one connection of this intuition. But then I think that intuition could also take a more divine spiritual element of what feels right, maybe outside of a physiological response. Do you experience a variance of the two? I think so. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) I know I certainly can because I can definitely, um, especially in like a post yoga scenario or if I'm doing meditation or if I'm going on a walk in silence, I can have a lot of aha intuition Mm -hmm. connection moments that maybe are not paired with a physiological gut sensation. But for instance, if something's more dynamic, like something's happening with Stella or uh, someone's yelling or there's like an emotional uprise, I get that gut sensation. Like it's like an overwhelming sensation where my body's telling me this isn't right. You need to change something. Totally. So I think that there's a difference there. And it's important that both our gut feelings and our intuition can be sequestered or silenced by our upbringing, by conditioning, by limiting beliefs, um, by discrediting, you know, that, oh, well, well, why would you listen to your intuition? You listen Mm -hmm. to logic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then all these past experiences create wounds or burns, and, and this creates like an army to reduce access and it's important for everyone that's listening to really think about how we can dismantle this this armor or this protective property so we can tap into this more higher self i guess or or this true self and and the and the messaging that helps us to make the right decisions for our household got it so it's more the feeling versus the thinking and rumination mhm most definitely And I think this is super important, especially, you know, at this time when there is so much out there to analyze and, and, you know, day-to-day facts are flying at us, facts in quotes, maybe um, (laughs) we're just trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what's going on with the pandemic. And I know you've been talking a lot about the amygdala recently and kind of the takeover of sorts, you know, when people are operating on their fear centers. And I think this is an area where we can really see intuition take a back seat or we forget to tap into that. Yeah, you know, so the amygdala is two different collections of cells near the base of our brain and they're kind of almond-shaped collections of cells and they play a role predominantly in fight or flight response. It's in the limbic system of the brain. And so this is more of our primal. Um, and it can play a role with how we process emotions, but it generally is is going to be activated for survival. So it's fight or flight and also like sexual instinct and um, you know all survival mechanisms essentially for the animal, if you will. And so the amygdala can activate this fight or flight response, which can provoke all of the physiological HPA axis overdrive, right? So we can see the epinephrine going up. We can see cortisol going up. We can see burnout of serotonin and GABA. And this can perpetuate with more enhanced uh, likelihood of sensitivity to fear, anxiety, agitation, and anger. Because once it's provoked or on, it can continue to, like you're walking in a dark alley and all of a sudden you're like, oh, something's coming mm-hmm. at me mm-hmm. because you're geared up or you're keyed up for a fight or flight stress response. And when the amygdala takes over, it can actually 
downgrade or interfere with the function of our more newer rational advanced brain system which is in the frontal lobe and this is where more reasoning decision making planning critical thinking and um, this is where we're able to really process and unpack emotions this is where we can manage and take them into logic (laughs) so we can take an argument and then say oh well maybe my child was hungry because of that right so you can you can take out different scenarios of why something happened and apply more logic and whereas the amygdala automatic response is going to be more survival mode the the concern is that when there is a mild threat that the frontal lobe will override the amygdala and say like, oh, no, no, like, yes, I'm walking in the dark in my neighborhood. A monster is clearly not coming after me. (laughs) This is okay. That sound might be another dog behind us or something like that. And then you'll have a rational, appropriate reaction. But when the threat is, again, perpetuated or strong, the amygdala acts quickly and it overpowers our frontal lobe. And this automatically triggers and perpetuates that fight or flight response. So this is where we can feel stronger anger or aggression or fear. And again, easier susceptibility to get into survival mode. And um, there was actually a psychologist, Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence. And he called this the amygdala hijack. And he mentioned that, you know, this is one way that you lose your emotional intelligence as a human being because you lose the capacity of critical thinking and reasoning. Yep. So it's that lizard brain, if you will, where we, you know, act without being super rational or without analyzing, you know, the different paths we could go down. Um, but this is this primitive part of the brain and, and uh, the limbic system of survival, essentially. And yeah, when it takes over, we just lose our ability to reason. And we often are more prone or honed in on negative memories or associations, again, perceived heightened threats. So if you think of it again in the constructs of like digging for information or really going down what people will say the rabbit hole per se um, in a fight or flight response, it can really interfere with critical thinking. And so it's important that we take time to reconnect with our frontal lobe, especially if we're experiencing anxiety or if we're experiencing a fight or flight response and and taking pause to ask ourselves what we feel like from the information, if it makes sense. And then maybe even taking time to incorporate breath work and meditation to slow down physiologically harnessing that HPA axis so that you can maybe tap into the more advanced human part of the brain, which is within that frontal lobe. Got it. And then beyond that, um, you know, intuition and listening to our gut, um, which I think is really, really needed at this time. Another area that I think is important to highlight within this, you know, more feminine perspective, I guess, um, is collaboration and connection. So whereas masculinity, we're looking at more, you know, competition or being bigger or greater or more powerful within the feminine, we're looking to actually connect with others. Yeah. And I think that that's really important because a lot of females, again, this isn't a gender thing. A lot of females could be very well more competitive than men Mm -hmm. and definitely cattier and jabbier (laughs) and judgier, if those are all words, but you know. Um, So I think that, yes, it's this kind of like openness and receptivity, but I think it's really important when you take pause that now that we're not competing for survival, right, of like said hunt to to feed our families or whatnot, we can actually cultivate community and connection. And the divine feminine really takes uh, high priority in meaningful relationships. And it's both the juxtaposition of removing drama, which is low, bri- low vibration. You know, drama sucks the soul. Uh, drama can break communal connection. And meaningful relationships really kind of pollinate and grow. And this way of connecting, whether it's with, you know, our children or the birthing process to create or whether it is finding like-minded women or men in community. And I think, like you said, really important during this time when there's been a lot of shelter in place and quarantining where people are, are really isolated. Um, and 
I think that we take for granted, we had talked about the you know healthy habits in pandemic episode, how people take for granted ritual and routine or like the passive human connection. Um, but I mean, I just had a session last week with a client that had not engaged physiologically with it, with a human since March. And this was, we're recording now August, uh, teens and you could just see it. It was like the, the eye sockets and there, there's a, lo- a lower vibration. There's an emptiness and, I think that we take for granted the necessity of connection and community for a healthy human experience. Totally. So what were some of the kind of takeaways that you gave to that client or some of the action items just to riff on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, so one was I had put in our goals to uh, increase walking in our, in our past uh, session, and I wanted the individual to get up to 10,000 steps a day. And, um, that wasn't done. And so I reemphasized, I was like, you know, it wasn't cause I said, you know, if you need to break it up into threes, even because the client was working from home. Right. So I said, even if you need to go in thirds and, and do a couple miles at a time, I really want you to get minimum 7,500, but upwards of 10,000 as the, as the goal. And I want you to do this all outside, you know? And so I reemphasized, it's not just to get vitamin D and also to get the bright sunlight on a pineal gland of the brain to help with melatonin and you know regulation away from the screen time and the artificial light. It's also to get fresh air and oxygenation and also support your immune system to be stimulated by pollen and antigen. But it's also, <laughs> so like five things, right? And, and to prevent atrophy of your muscle structure and support your structural health, get some weight bearing activity. But it's also for the experience of humanity. I said, even if you're not physiological able, you need to sit outside for a minimum an hour a day. If you find a park bench, watch people hug, watch people smile, watch people touch each other. And you need to get out there and try to do that as best you can as well. But just even experiencing in a 3D realm community is different than you would do with a virtual community experience. Just watching a true 3D experience would likely have different physiological influence like oxytocin and some of these connection neurotransmitters that are needed to support whole body health. Totally. And that's so different during this time with, you know, a lot of people out there wearing masks, even outside and you can't see their facial expressions and just this element of of fear or, you know, removal from... (laughs) um, that connection and, and kind of fear of even our neighbors. So definitely finding that and manifesting it wherever you can. And I think all the more emphasis on, you know, those meaningful relationships and connection. Yeah. I mean, I have, as we've shared, you know, we've potted per se, if that's a term potting, um, like P O D not T potting, um, through this experience. And it's been such a blessing. I think that we've had, uh, you know, collaborative work environment, Becky, but that we're <laughs> able to do family dinners that we're able to, um, you know, still connect and engage and get daily hugs from each other. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All of it's really important. Um, like sometimes I'll hug Becky three times just cause it, it's great. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's really such a blessing and that hopefully, you know, depending on how we navigate all this, that we at least find kind of tribal community. Um, we, you know, we've done that with some Estella's friends where it's like you continue to connect, you continue to share food with each other. You continue to, again, physically touch, um, all of that's really important. And especially when you're bringing in the disconnection, um, Becky of those passive experiences because of masking. Mm -hmm. And I think that I I was going to read something, um, from the book on killing that I just found to be really pretty, pretty mind blowing over the weekend when I was sharing about the safety of masking with public schools. And, um, there's a book that is really well regarded in the military sphere and it's called on killing. Um, and they basically talk about operative conditioning training for soldiers and that there's research that have seen that if the combatant looks different than the soldier, there's 40% easier, um, influence for the soldier to not feel empathy, compassion, or fear. Uh, but if the combatant has a face covering, it's 60% on average, more difficult to connect with that person. Um, and so the way that the human brain works basically is if we continue to lose the 21 different facial expressions that are very important to learning human behavior and nonverbal communication, 
we're going to lose this innate connection with empathy and, you know, with feeling, um, compassion and um, joy and having these passive relationships, which I feel may be more and more muted. Um, so I think whatever we can do as a society to hold on and harness that passive relationship is just as much as the proactive. Totally. And then, you know, within this too, I think um, this is a, a time of extreme discernment, if you will, where it's like, kind of brings to everything that's going on kind of brings to light, you know, relationships that might not be serving us and, and areas where, like you said, that drama is low vibration or there's been something kind of, you know, bubbling up for a while. And it's like, "Mm, maybe time to cut that out and just focus on, you know, our locus of control and, and the people who are really important to us. Yeah. And it's interesting again, again, that balance of masculinity and femininity maybe you require some of channeling of the masculine masculinity excuse me of the analytical self to take a pause and reflect on relationships <laughs> you know maybe you need to take some analytical approach of, of you know the the reciprocal relationship with a friendship or with a coworker or whatnot and then you pull in that strength of femininity to have the conversation uh, but I think it's all very intertwined for sure totally and then beyond community and connecting with others, um, the self-talk element and, and inner spirit kind of healing piece um, and focusing on creation versus destruction is, I think, an important piece to pull in. Yeah. You know, so like I said prior, like what are you birthing, right? Mm-hmm. And I know that's a question that uh, Dr. Deb Kern uses with us often in dance class um, in the sisterhood of the Shakti sisterhood when we're doing Prana Shakti what are you birthing today? And I think that that's a very feminine concept, obviously, Uh, but it could be something creative. It could be an intention. It could be a purpose. It could be a mission. And this, this femininity of creation versus destruction, like when angry and when in the fear centered, we want to break, we want to smash, we want to destroy, we want to break down walls or, you know, hit things. Uh, But there's this very gentle, powerful component of pottery making or repairing or or gluing back together and I think we can think of this within our own self and also within different physiological things that we do so within our own self it can be experienced even in the world of self-talk you know are you doing that nocebo effect of breaking down yourself and destroying yourself as your silent inner critic where you know you're just having harmful self-talk of what you shouldn't be doing um, or what's going wrong or how you can't do anything or how everything's so X, Y, Z, you can, as we discussed in many episodes, especially the one running on adrenaline, I'll call out episode 129, we talked a lot about how even cognitive dissonance can drive up adrenaline. And I think that that's really important to call out, especially, and I mean, I just have to tie everything back to the current timestamp. But for instance, I've, I've consulted with a lot of parents right now where they're making the household choice, you know, to send their kids back to school and they feel heartbroken about the idea of their children wearing masks uh, as a, for instance, but yet they're doing it and they find overall the cost of benefit. The child might be nine years old and is asking to go back to school with their friends. Then, then you need to, in your own divine self, make peace with that concept. Even though you may analytically say, I'm concerned about X, Y, Z, or the long-term Im- impact, you have to make peace with the timestamp that you're committing to, or you're going to constantly be feeling like you're tearing at yourself on a daily basis. So maybe it's a, just a resolution reflection statement where it's, the positive of my daughter experiencing friendship will outweigh any fear that I have for this time being. I will ruthlessly fight for movement and freedom in the meanwhile. And then you're able to position, accept, but also be proactive with a passion. And it doesn't feel like you're sending your child to something that you don't ultimately feel good about. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. And that can you know, be extended to, again, relationships that can be extended to a job that maybe isn't super fulfilling, but we have to stay in for the time being because it's not a great time to go and look for another job and, and beyond. Right. So, I mean, maybe it's a stepping stone and it's something against your ethics. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, though, that by doing that step, you need to take to get to the next step to manifest again, what your big picture goals are. 
you make peace with that. So I think acknowledging and releasing is even within this creation over destruction. And it's important that we associate the idea of maybe pausing and reflecting if we are destructing our own self with our self-talk, finding neutrality, and then maybe even finding a, a place for positivity within that and what you can create or manifest. Sure. And, you know, these things aren't mutually exclusive. So sometimes you need the destruction to manifest the creation. And then you might even find, if this doesn't resonate with you, you might even find a way within your space to push your creative self Mm. in a more uh, physiological or like mixed media, right? An actual tangible outlet. So maybe this looks like um, doing a collage and tearing things out of magazines and gluing things. Maybe it looks like uh, playing with watercolors. Maybe it looks like painting rocks, like yep. we've been doing in our house a lot. Um, maybe it looks like painting a box village in your backyard, or or who knows. But finding creativity, playing with your wardrobe and expression, uh, makeup, different color stories, um, and so all of this is a way to kind of find that femininity within and and create. Yeah, and then beyond that, another element of femininity is connection with the goddess and earth and seasons. So I'm thinking about like gardening and outdoor activity is another way to um, kind of harness that creativity. Most definitely. And we think of nature being cyclical and, and seasonal. That's so connected to like the menstrual cycle and the moon and all of this really harnesses that space. Um, so taking pause to experience nature, holding space for what is within your seasons of your relationships, your seasons within your age and your shifts within your body hormonally, uh, you know, acceptance and stillness and observation is really what we look at within this space. And I think getting outside for an hour daily is a bare minimum. And instead of that prior idea of getting outside with the walking steps for that client to connect with community and to experience humanity, I think in this sense, this is actually more seeking silence. So ideally you get outside for two hours a day, (laughs) one where you get to experience humanity and the other where you get to experience some form of wonder. And I think wander is around us everywhere. Um, I used to say when I moved to Texas from Washington State, like, oh, I really, <laughs> I mean, there is, I, I think there's something to say about the ocean and mountains as a different level of wander or awe-inspiring or that just like shakes your core of, of just this majesty, magnificence. Um, But there's wonder all around us. And if we take pause in watching the shifts within even the insect kingdom, you know, this time of fall of, excuse me, spring, Stella and I watched monarch butterflies at grandma's and talked about the different metamorphosis phases and the cocoon. And that was a really awesome experience to have together and um, that really requires this observation and stillness in nature. Totally. I just put up um, some bird feeders near our house and I'm enjoying like watching the hummingbirds come and then, you know, the birds and the squirrels having their little <laughs> fight out there for the bird seed. And it's been really cool to to bring that into our space. Yeah. Your baby will love that. I can yeah. see that's like <laughs> going to be a space to sit and breastfeed and he'll just be in the, in the sounds. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So we have one more area to dive into and then some practical steps for you all today. But before we go into that, I want to discuss our mid-roll sponsor, which is Ourselves Naturally Nourished. But today we're not talking to you about our supplement line. Today we are talking to you about our virtual program, Adrenal Rehab. Yes, this is such a great connection with today's topic and you know the, the piece of taking a pause and tapping back into your intuition and maybe doing a little bit of digging and kind of self-work on on areas to optimize right now. Um, So our adrenal rehab program is an evergreen program. So unlike our keto program, which runs three times a year live, this is a program that you can access at any time and any stage. Um, It's three plus hours of video content with Allie that we break up into bite-sized chunks. So everything from restoring your gut to 
implementing some of these tools like, you know, grounding and getting outside and getting in nature and just kind of bite-sized practical approaches that you can take. Um, We also have customized interactive worksheets, five cooking demos and recipes in the kitchen. So learning, you know, different ingredients that will address that fight or flight access of the body and and support your stress response Four weekly check-in emails. So we disperse those out throughout the program and then supplement and lab recommendations. Yes. So this is an evergreen program. There's no start date per se. So you can join it at any time, but you can use the code now adrenal 99. So the code is adrenal 99 and you will get $99 off. So instead of it being $199, it will be only $100. So go on over to AllieMillerRD.com, check out under our programs, Adrenal Rehab, and use the code ADRENAL99 so that you will be able to get that program for just $100. You get lifetime access to the materials, and the worksheets that are really relevant with today's concept are things like mantra and self-talk so we actually have particular customized interactive materials that help you to download the cassette tape of your brain and restructure those thoughts and um, create different mantras understand the influence of particular words within your self-talk and if they are negative influencing even if you don't perceive them to be Uh, we have also which i think is really relevant uh, materials that support your allostatic load or basically your overall stress threshold So it's this really cool worksheet that you take in things like, you know, where your stress levels are current um, by seeing how many hours of sleep you're getting, if you're exercising, if you're using sauna, if you are battling a gut pathogen, if there's other things going on physiologically in your body. And then it will provide you tools to create more bubble wrap or resilience, um, lifestyle offsets. So like if you're doing more than six hours of screen time, Here's blue blocker glasses you can use. Here's different screen settings to change. Here's a goal of getting outside within the first hour of the day to really manifest that melatonin uh, and so much more. So I think it's really a powerful tool when we're talking about the impact of stress on physiological health. Uh, You can also on that page, check out a free quiz, which we'll link in the notes as well. And this is a quiz that will help you to determine of your HPA access, whether you are in overdrive, stressed and wired or in underdrive more adrenal burnout or insufficiency, stressed and tired. And then it will guide you with suggestions based on those results. We use that in our keto program as well. And it's one of those that really yields outcomes. I would say like a third plus of the people that are uh, filling out the surveys at the end say, whoa, the stress module really was that game change. And I think beyond the idea of stress in all of this, Um, Again, this connection with femininity or your gentle spirit or your inner wisdom is a tool that will help to guide you through your decision-making process for your entire life and also a way to provoke a higher connection so that quality of life throughout your day-to-day experience is different. Yep. And I can't think of a better time as kind of a self check in, you know, six plus months into yeah, lockdown. Now, and Now we got the kids yep, like yep, under control. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, we're in October now. And so I have to remind Becky these things. Oh, you're right. Your baby's like six out. months. See, um. <laughs> you're breastfeeding right now, actually, okay, Becky. Okay. <laughs> he has an awesome latch and everything's good everything's in the universe. Good. <laughs> yes. And um, I'm exploring new areas of femininity every day. <laughs> yes. Oh, if, if pregnancy doesn't do that, uh-huh. I don't know what does. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. So um, kind of this final area, and I think that that relates here for sure with uh, a little bit more on the body connection is sensuality and passion. Yes. So, you know, passion can be just what lights you up. It can be your mission, your vigor, your drive, which again, may be perceived as masculine, but it's all about how you express it. So expressing your passion in a clear proactive way and being a powerful voice in an arena is absolutely still divinely feminine. And in fact, the level of passion often in women, because we take on this like survivor warrior mama mode, can often be higher or stronger, felt in a different vibration, if you will. 
Um, but this is also about sensuality in, in, in connection with the self, um, connecting with sexuality, which we think of usually sensuality being feminine and sexuality being masculine. Again, not gender. Women have sexuality and sensuality. But some women, like I myself, had to work a lot more on sensuality than sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, I'm, I'm totally in the like, okay, let's just get her done. Grab the, <laughs> coconut, grab the coconut oil and let, I got to, you know, write a patient chart. Um, so <laughs> that's just me. Like it's a lot of work for me to surrender to sensuality. Um, and I've honestly pulled from uh, the episode that we did with Susan Bratton, um, the breast massage has been something that I've incorporated, incorporated, excuse me, in my relationship. And that's like a slow down thing that, um, I'll do like, at, Brady and I'll do like once a month at least. And that's like a good, like, okay, sensual element or back massage. I'm good at, I'm good at always, I'm, I will always take a back massage. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but otherwise, yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to note, but on the idea of sexuality and the connection, um, you know, oxytocin and orgasm have so many health supporting benefits. Um, we talked about a lot of that with Dr. Anna Kabeka in the postmenopausal support episode, which I'll link also in the show notes. Um, so this can be with or without a partner, um, but the body really does thrive based on touch. Um, so even the subtle things like um, a really yummy massage oil and um, rubbing that on your own body and just committing to five minutes of actually using hand on arm and really exploring your body and feeling what feeling feels like feeling what feeling feels like that's the pull quote of the episode um, <laughs> but you know and again and not in a sexual way but in a sensual way feeling yourself and then from the inside self feeling yourself being felt um and and, and that's a really important part of the human experience um so i, I think that and, and then you can take a more masculine approach to provoking this and and we do this in a dance class with dr deb where we um like tap our body right so we like hit our arms and our legs and our solar plexus and our back and our bellies and our chests and we're provoking lymphatic movement from stagnation but we're also kind of waking up the body and saying i am here Mm -hmm. i'm in my space i think that's a huge thing to you know just a a really practical tool to remind yourself of where you are in space because i think a lot of us spend so much more time even in our heads right now and and kind of getting back into that physicality is so important so literally putting your hands on your own body i know i've been doing a ton of body oil and like belly balm just with you know growing body (laughs) trying to prevent stretch marks, but it's also been just a nice tool to like add in things that smell good. And I got this really thick, nice like belly butter, that's shea butter and coconut um, oil. And then I also use the everyday oil, which I'll link. I know that's a a huge favorite for both of us. Um, But spending a little bit more time doing that, you know, getting out of the necessity of like, oh, my skin's dry. I need to like quick slap on some moisturizer and like slowing down in the evening and taking, like you said, at least five minutes to really connect. I think that's so important, most definitely. And then moving your tongue in your mouth was something that um, Jody brought in when we were doing dance class last yeah. week. <laughs> we were like in happy baby mode and she's like, take your tongue along your gum line and rub it like along your teeth and your gum line vigorously and then she's like that stimulates your vagina (laughs) we're like thanks (laughs) i don't know the accuracy of that but i feel like it kind of does yep i think so um and i know (laughs) susan bratton talked a lot about that and kind of the role of different orifices of the body and kind of different sphincters that's also something i've been reading a lot about in um ina may gaskin's work on childbirth and how you have to relax all of the sphincters in your body. So like your mouth and your jaw really being intrinsically connected to your cervix and and kind of opening there. And even thinking in the energetics of like throat Mm -hmm. chakra and and voicing yourself uh, to think of a way of also like opening and releasing. I think that that's huge for sure. Yes. Um, And yeah, maybe that transitions us into more movement for femininity or other kind of practical things that we can do 
with our own bodies. Yes. So we'll also link the episode that we did with Dr. Deb Kern, Movement as Medicine. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I do as a daily takeaway, I do often that body kind of breakdown, and that's how we start most classes, but I also do hip circles. And um, now this doesn't just mean like rotating your hips back and forth. So a couple things that I like to do with hips, um, with an easy kind of start before hip circles, which are actually quite of a grand movement, um, going on all fours and doing like cat and cow and then swaying with your hips. So you start to kind of wag your tail, if you will. Um, and that starts to make these C curves and your obliques, and that starts to kind of awaken your core area, but also your hips. But hip circles are, you know, rotating, gyrating, if you will, your hips around, like an around the world motion. And so you can start with like five of those and then you make them bigger where you start to pull in. I'm, I'm moving away from the microphone as I'm doing this. You, you start to move your core and your chest. So you think of like your sternum joining in that plane with your hips where you're moving around the world. And then you might pick your arms up around your head and uh, and all the way back. And, and that's the noise. Like there's always, Deb will say, make a sound. There's a sound coming from there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that like old lady, uh, release. <laughs> That's the sound that I make. Um, but it does, yeah. it's very liberating. It's the best way to like ring you out in the morning. Um, and there's th- this this ocean within and, and the hip circles really create this fluidity and provoke the, the feminine part of the body. Yep. I noticed that being pregnant, I just tend to do that more when I'm like standing, trying to kind of work something out. I'm like constantly doing this infinity symbol thing with my hips. Yeah. And I do that on my yoga ball all yep. the time during yep. clinic. The, that too. Yep, right yep. and left and right and left. Uh, but I do find honestly by just that physical practice, even if I'm not thinking about anything feminine, that that does kind of set a tone that's more spiral, more circular, if you will. And that's something that's femininity, swirls and curves, like the cycles of nature, whereas masculinity is more straight lines. So my home now is kind of like a, I don't know, what what is it called? I know it's modern, but is it called like a rustic, I don't know, what's it, like a modern farmhouse style or something like that? I don't know. It's very boxy. Um, modern. Just modern. Okay. I don't know. There's not much rustic, I guess. Um, but it's very boxy. And so we have these like black metal framed windows, which I love. And there is warmth in our uh, white oak floors. And that creates a little bit of that feminine balance to like the, the masculine rectangle lines. But the house itself is very rectangle. And then in the rooms, you know, there's a lot of just straight lines, 90 degree angles. And so I've worked as best I can to pull in organic elements, like more plants, Mm -hmm. um, to pull in more, like I've round chairs in my office. I purposefully selected a oval dining table and chairs that are rounded because I wanted to actually create an environment that balances masculinity and femininity and heaven to earth and that kind of juxtaposition of, of swirls with straight lines. Yep. I think that's something a lot of people aren't even aware of in their own space, but kind of looking for those curvatures versus just the straight lines and and bringing that into balance within your own personal style. I think it's really cool. And there's such an organic element Mm -hmm. to that. Have you, you've been to the new space with Element, right? The skin spa. Yeah. yeah. So she has these, um, her design studio created these, like, they look like clay, like Adobe, right? Like, Mm -hmm. like handmade rounded, um, walls essentially of like where the facial spots are. And it's a really cool, it's a, it's, I told her, I was like, that's such a great positioning of femininity in this space. And she's like, I never thought of it that way. She's Mm -hmm. like, but it totally is. is. It is. (laughs) And I was like, oh yeah, it's like lush. It has that like fertile, it it just, it just is. Yeah. Yep. She probably didn't even realize she was doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So that's an interesting thing to start to observe in nature. Um, So like, you know, the trunk of the tree is the masculine, the leaf, the canopy is the feminine. Um, And so just start to kind of be open to that in visual and then also within your physical space, how you can create that balance. And the, the last thing I'd say with physical movement that I thought was really interesting that we discussed in that episode with Deb was that the feminine is the back of the body or the behind the heart. Um, You think of like, you know, like, oh, like chest bump in, Mm. like (laughs) masculinity in your sternum. And I think I lived my life from, I mean, for so much of my life, but at, at least in my professional adult life, I would say I lived from age like 22 
to 32, probably until I had Stella Mm -hmm. in that masculine space. And I ran my business like that and I ran my life like that. And I was like ready to attack any time. Like, like, let me add them, let me add them kind of, (laughs) kind of vibe is the best way I can describe it. Um, and I've discussed that, like I called it wounded masculinity once I've kind of awoken to this need of balance. And I think that that wounded masculinity creates this kind of hurt or need to compete again, instead of collaborate, it creates this fight or this aggression instead of um, communal um, and receiving, it's, it's outputting. And we need both again. We don't want to just be a, a weak, apathetic receiver. You mm-hmm. know, we're not saying that. We're just saying that there's this, this softer back part that can receive and then can allow analyzing and then can manifest in a way that is more frontal lobe than amygdala and something that is more evolved and human versus primal and survival. I know that was a huge area of opening for you within Deb's class within the last like year and a half or so. Yeah. I cried a lot. And, um, I think still like when I do big hip circles, my sternum cracks every time. Uh And I always joke and I'm like, that's my wounded masculinity breaking every time. (laughs) There's tiny little parts Uh of it. I think that every time that's what I like in my sternum breaking too. And it happens in yoga sometimes Uh too. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. And Deb even says to the idea of like play with walking backwards just to like balance yourself out. I haven't done it, but I can already envision how silly it would be and how much it would check my masculinity. Oh, totally. Um, but like, right, just operationally take 30 minutes of your day within your household that you make yourself go backwards through things, through, you know, to grab something from the other room or whatever. And it does, it kind of, it kind of provokes or awakens uh, the hind heart. Yeah. And I think that's an area of the body that generally gets really ignored or we kind of forget about because we're so forward facing all the time and projecting and talking and putting things out that we're like forgetting about the receiving and kind of the gentle backside of our body. Which can, <laughs> which if we're receiving and if we're intuitive, then we can actually have so much more power than maybe the output. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really important to note. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an awesome journey. I hope that this is a interesting episode for you guys. I, I think that this topic is something, like I said, that personally has helped me to grow. And I want to share with you one of my femininity fails though, because I think it's funny. And then we'll talk about some practical uh, sure. tips. So I am doing these photo shoots to try to be a quote unquote good brand or influencer or whatnot. <laughs> so I'm in this package with um, Riley, who's awesome from Woke Beauty, and she puts beautiful imagery together. And she works with, in this kind of feminine, I'd say, scope of like really helping women share their story. Yeah. She works with imagery for like provoking storytelling. And I'm always like, girl, I don't know if I have a story. I just like, I don't know. I'll just like sit on this rock <laughs> or whatever. And I like try to like, you know, uh, do something or whatever. Like, okay, whatever. Um, and so I, I was like, oh, I'm going to buy all these outfits for my photo shoot. And I'm going to like be so much more feminine. Well, you guys will see because I'm sure some of the images will be out. And I actually found like one kind of like ballerina pink dress, which would totally not even be in my scope of considering. And I felt like I was able to rock that. That looked great. Because I was able to channel <laughs> yes. my ballerina self. Yes. Um, and, you know, so I'm like in the water, kicking water and like trying to find my like inner fairy, ethereal being. Um, but but I ordered like 17 dresses and so many of them are so colonial. <laughs> and that's like Becky's vibe. Um, but like just just so frilly and there's lace and there's things that like I was geeking out. Brady was laughing at me and he's like, well, I mean, you could pull it off. <laughs> And I'm like, um, and, and it's funny because Stella, my daughter says, I'm a dress kind of girl. And like, she's already probably going to be, start becoming more feminine mm-hmm. on the outside scope than me, where I'm like shorts and a t-shirt kind of girl, um, throw my hair up in a sloppy bun and call it a day. Um, but I think still evolution. I wore a pink dress. That's pretty shocking yeah, that's, for me. That's Th- big. Mm-hmm. Three years ago, that would have never happened. Yeah. When you guys FaceTimed us, um, I was like, Becky, you were I doing a try on session. I was dying. Um, and I'm like, that's something I would wear definitely, but you're not really a ruffles and frills kind of girl. Yes. And how about you, Becky, any like aha moments in your femininity exploration in the last couple of years, anything you think is helpful for people to hear or just personal reflection? Mm, 
great question. <laughs> do you feel like being at the liberal arts women's college, there was more femininity than today? Or do you feel like motherhood and movement? Like what, what parts do you feel like? I think if anything, that was still a very cerebral experience. And, um, you know, I studied, I was a, a study of women and gender is what we called it major <laughs> at Smith College, which was a women's college. But I think because it was still highly academic and there was a lot of, um, even, you know, within that, like discernment of gender pronouns and, and kind of getting into that world and Almost analytical. Yeah, very, very analytical. Um, so in that way, I think that experience was more kind of masculine self um, and that, you know, motherhood and home ownership and, um, kind of the last couple of years of creation of career has been more kind of tapping back into femininity. Um, and I definitely think movement for me is a huge, huge part of that too. And finding different types of movement as I get older, like I was a runner and, um, I was doing yoga, you know, in college, but I was a runner, which is much more like boxy line structure, <laughs> straight mm-hmm. line, you know, sprinting and, and high intensity. Um, I used to do, you know, spin classes like crazy and I haven't done anything like that in <laughs> a long time. And even, you know, weightlifting and, and kind of that I got out of because we stopped going to the gym with the pandemic and I'm doing more yoga and walking and gentle movement. And that feels really good in my body. And especially the dance class, I have to like get myself out of my head a lot. Um, yeah. And I think that's an important practice, even if you feel like, you know, a total idiot or it feels uncomfortable or not, uh, automatically intuitive. It's, you know, a practice for sure. And, um, yeah, I feel like movement's been a big one. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So final action on channeling your divine femininity. I think our first thing would say dance more. Yep. Move your body. (laughs) Dance more. And yes, move your body. Um, I would say stillness and silence. Really important because you can't hear that inner self um, if there's too much noise going on. And even within that on a vibration level, like turning off electronic devices, breaking from EMF, that's going to hit that epinephrine adrenaline surge of the fight or flight amygdala part of the brain so literally getting into a still silent space maybe even getting your feet into the grass or into the ocean or into the mud something that's really grounding and still and silent and that takes us to the next one which would be getting outside and witnessing the cyclical connections of nature at least an hour a day outside and then the final one i would say is like incorporating sense um so incorporating all of your senses so if we're talking about touch taste smell um hearing all of these different ways are ways to provoke kind of the inner god goddess within so doing like incense or uh, body oil like we said running a diffuser um, playing with different textures and flavors on your tongue and then even listening to different types of music. Maybe if you're doing more classical, listening to singer-songwriter stuff, play some Carole King, mm-hmm. <laughs> Jody Mitchell. I'll do a femininity play, play playlist. Mac and, yeah, <laughs> Stevie Nicks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, So hopefully today's episode was enjoyable for you all and has some action items and ways that you can find your femininity and fluidity for whole body, mind, and spirit balance, which is ultimately, you know, what wellness is all about. So if you enjoyed today's episode, go on over to iTunes or Google Play or wherever you're listening to today's podcast. Leave us a five-star review and maybe a sentence of what you love about the Naturally Nourished podcast. Also, be sure to comment and share. If you're listening to our podcast, you can always screenshot it and tag Allie Miller RD on Instagram. Let people know what you're learning and liking, and we always appreciate that. And take a moment to go on over to AllieMillerRD.com where you can check out our adrenal rehab program using the code ADRENAL99 and check out all of our formulas to elevate your health. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.